use of natural resources. And both capital and labor will be free to grow and flourish to the benefit of all mankind. Before we explore the advantages of this remedy over the present system, let's clearly understand what we mean by rent. The value of land varies widely, from barren, worthless properties you couldn't give away, to high-income downtown developments, where even the airspace sells for hundreds of thousands of dollars per cubic acre. The quality of soil, the water supply, the modes of access and density of the population, all these are factors that determine the value of land. And time and technology have caused land values to rise higher and higher. A hundred years ago, the Alaskan territories were a national laughingstock. Seward's Folly, they called it. And President Lincoln had to practically beg the Congress to complete the purchase for $7.2 million, only two cents an acre. Today, soaring values and the discovery of oil have turned Seward's Folly into one of the most precious tracts of land in the world, conservatively estimated at trillions. The value of a particular piece of land is determined by the rent that it potentially commands. The economic rent of a specific piece of land can be roughly calculated as the difference between its maximum potential productivity and that of less productive land actually in use. In other words, the economic rent will be proportional to the purchase price of land sold without improvement. Let's take a simple illustration of an area where oranges are one of the principal crops. The least productive acreage of land in this area can produce perhaps 100 bushels of oranges per acre. Here, however, on equivalent acreage, where the soil and climate are more favorable, the same farmer with the same investment of capital and labor could produce 1,000 bushels of oranges per acre. The value that would be assigned to this richer land would then be calculated as the difference between its productivity of a thousand bushels with that of the least productive land worth a hundred bushels. Since the value of this land is higher, the rent that would be generated is also proportionately higher. When a tax is placed on the economic rent of land, whether used or not, or whether the land is suited for agriculture or industry or urban commerce, the user of the land will inevitably use it and produce wealth to its maximum potential. And because of the continuing incentive to use the land for maximum productivity, the withholding of natural resources or unfair economic advantage will become a thing of the past. Here is a premium piece of land, as yet undeveloped, but harboring the potential for excellent commercial productivity situated near a booming metropolitan area and easily accessible from all directions, this property is just begging to be built up into a vacation paradise that will not only provide terrific income for its owner and dozens if not hundreds of jobs, but will be an asset to the public as well. Why then does it sit idle? Yeah, I picked up this property in 67 for $6,000 an acre. Last week, I turned down an offer for nine times what I paid for it. Are you kidding? I got a gold mine here. All I got to do is sit and watch the price go up and up and up. Now, the day I lift a finger to develop this place, my assessment's going to skyrocket. I'm paying almost no taxes now. And if I start building that hotel, I'll be shelling out improvement taxes through the nose long before I ever see a nickel of return on my investment. The county assessor was down just the other day. Speculation is the name of the game. But let's imagine another reality. Let's hear what this same shrewd investor has to say when the entire tax structure is changed so that revenues are collected not from property improvement taxes, but from just the value of the land itself, economic rent. Oh, yes, this is beautiful property. And I was assessed at a substantially higher value than just about any other land in the county. I was paying an arm and a leg in land value taxes. I couldn't afford to sit on it anymore. I was faced with a choice, either develop it myself or sell out to someone who would. 
The fantastic thing is that even after the hotel started making money, I still wasn't paying any more taxes than before. So I can afford to pour some more capital into the property and really put it to work. Hey, I'm working for a living now. Slumlording and speculation, crime and violence that breed in these rotting city slums, all this is the result of our present property tax system. It's a system that discourages building, development, and urban renewal. Taxes on improvement and building materials and production of goods and services encourage landlords to sit back and get fat while doing nothing to use the lands they control. The result is slums, because it pays to let them rot. Unemployment, because non-productivity means no jobs. And inflation, because prices soar while production crawls. And the consumer bears the burden. Already saddled with his own property improvement taxes for building and maintaining his home, and income taxes that slice substantial chunks out of his lifestyle, our average American ends up paying for the heavy revenues that are levied from public and private industry as well. The industry doesn't blink when they're hit with heavy taxation. They just pass it right along to you. We are born into a very difficult and challenging life. And we're given the strength, the skills, the natural potential, and the imagination to create for ourselves and for our children a world that works, a world that fills the highest desires of human civilization, desire for knowledge, desire for health, desire for human companionship, for close friends and healthy family life, and a sense of community, of love, and of mutual respect. Desire for material things, and for more than material things. Desire for creative way of life where we earn our basic comforts and share our dreams. Where we work together to go beyond the struggle for subsistence and survival toward the fullest potential of human society. It begins from access to the land, from the realization that the material and spiritual wealth we all desire is available through free and equal access to the limited and unlimited resources that can flow from this fantastic planet through the uninhibited growth of knowledge and know-how in the mind of man. It will begin with a rejection of a corrupt and unworkable tax system that strangles productivity and causes inflation, stagnation, and unemployment, that paralyzes the potential growth of our free enterprise system. It begins with a move toward land value taxation, the clear vision of Henry George, who saw that all revenues should be collected only from a tax on natural resources that are the rightful property of all mankind. It will unleash the enormous potential of management and capital to fill the needs of a rapidly expanding world and solve the ever-increasing problems of unemployment and inflation. No longer will willing and capable individuals be unable to convert their labor into a livelihood for themselves and their families. Perhaps best of all, a tax on economic rent cannot be passed on to the consumer in the form of higher prices and rising cost of living, because the cost of production will no longer be inflated by multiple taxation that rises higher and higher with every increase in production. Modern economists who have followed in the footsteps of Henry George have developed these basic ideas into a complete and comprehensive proposal. Man is entitled to the benefits of what he creates, not to usurp what others have created, and certainly not to monopolize natural resources. The creative right is the most basic right, but who can claim that right with regard to land? We have at our disposal the tools and the resources necessary to build a civilization blessed with material wealth and technological sophistication, a civilization that is free and just in every detail, a civilization that fulfills without compromise the noblest desires of all mankind. As always, 
the choice is ours. Near the window by which I write, a great bull is tethered by a rope around his neck. Grazing round and round, he has wound his rope about the stake until now he stands a close prisoner, tantalized by rich grass he cannot reach. Unable even to toss his head to rid him of the flies that cluster on his shoulders. This bull, a very type of massive strength, who because he has not wit enough to see how he might be free, suffers want in sight of plenty and is helplessly preyed upon by weaker creatures, seems to me no unfit emblem of the working masses. But until they trace effect to cause, until they see how they are fettered and how they may be freed, their struggles and outcries are as vain as those of the bull. Nay, they are vainer. I shall go out and drive the bull in the way that will untwist this rope. But who shall drive men into freedom? What God created for the use of all should be utilized for the benefit of all. What is produced by the individual belongs rightfully to the individual. Henry George. Men like Henry George are rare, unfortunately. One cannot imagine a more beautiful combination of intellectual keenness, artistic form, and fervent love of justice. Albert Einstein. People do not argue with the teaching of George. They simply do not know it. The teaching of George is irresistibly convincing in its simplicity and clearness. He who becomes acquainted with it cannot but agree. Leo Tolstoy. I have made speeches to you by the yard on the taxation of land values, and you know what a strong supporter I have always been of that policy, Winston Churchill. I believe in the taxation of land values only, Justice Lewis D. Brandeis. A reform like this will be worked out sometime in the future, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs>